Morning, everyone. I'm just going to allow people another minute or so to join before we get going. Just looking at the numbers of participants going up at the moment, we've got a good number of people registered for this webinar. Um, so I'm just going to allow the latecomers, as I say, just a minute to get joining. Okay, that's at, us at a minute past 10, uh, so we'll we'll start moving. Morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people joining us for this webinar on international data transfers. We are Shepherd and Wedderburn's media and technology team, and we specialise in a range of areas, including data protection, which, as you can imagine, is one of the more interesting and fast-moving areas that we cover. My name's Joanna Bogue-Thompson. I'm one of the partners in the media and technology team. And my colleague, Joe Fitzgibbon, is one of our associates. Joe, would you like to take us through the agenda? Of course. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, we're going to do a whistle-stop tour of the evolving world of international data transfers. And to kick things off, we'll, we'll provide a bit of context around the UK GDPR, and how that sits alongside the EU GDPR in the context of the UK. We'll then touch upon key issues such as adequacy when transferring personal data, together with other mechanisms for transferring data that comply with both the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR. We'll then dive into what I suspect will be the meat of today's presentation, looking at the updated standard contractual clauses in the UK and the EU. We'll then touch upon the conducting of data transfer impact assessments, which is a, a new task that we're all getting used to. And then we'll touch upon dealing with transfers from the UK and the EU to third countries, it would be remiss of us not to touch on the evolving position regarding the EU-US transfer position, and we'll also finish off with some practical examples about what we're, uh, what we're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis in practice. So let's start with the fundamentals, and, and apologies if this is recapping uh, a lot of what you already know, but it's useful context particularly to assess where we are now and where we might get to in future. So over four years ago, back in May 2018, the EU GDPR came into force, and this replaced the archaic EU Data Protection Directive. Alongside this in the UK, we had a bit of an upgrade from the Data Protection Act 1998 to the UK Data Protection Act 2018. And then we had this transition period during Brexit, and in which, uh, during which phase the UK made the very sensible decision uh, to replicate the EU GDPR as uh, within UK law, adjusting for you know, certain uh, elements of UK terminology, updating institutions, etc. So we now have a dual regime um, applying to the UK, both, both the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR. And it's important to note that UK businesses, as, as well as other businesses um, based in, in, in the EU and outside the EU, may be subject to both of these regimes. And I guess a common theme of today's presentation will be that there's a good amount of alignment between these regimes at the moment, but that may be subject to divergence as we move forward, particularly with the UK government's current agenda. So I'm now going to pass back on to Joe to, to kick us off with some of the substantive content today. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start off with data transfers from the EU and the EEA to us in the UK and to elsewhere, um, because that's still something that's important to remember. So currently, as you know, the EU allows the free flow of personal data between member states. The UK is no longer one of those member states, so we don't benefit from that ability to share personal data because we're a member state, as well as sharing data between member states, the EU permits the sharing of data within the EEA as well. Okay, so that's Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein. But if you go beyond those borders, you need to have some sort of mechanism in place that adequately safeguards the personal data when you're transferring it internationally. And so a number of jurisdictions have decisions on adequacy. And what that means is that the European Union has assessed 
the laws in place in those jurisdictions and has decided that they are adequate. And that means that you're allowed to share personal data with those jurisdictions. And round about this time last year, in June 2021, we were all getting really quite worked up because nobody was entirely sure whether the UK was going to get an adequacy decision. Thankfully, we did at the end of June, and that stays in place until June 2025. And at that point, it's subject to a review. However, depending on what happens with the data reform bill, it could be reviewed earlier on. Um, so for now, because we have this equivalence between EU GDPR and UK GDPR, we have the adequacy decision that allows data to be exported from the EU and EEA into the UK. And there's a number of other countries on the EU's list, but very importantly, the US is not one of the countries that has an adequacy decision. And that proves quite an issue for a lot of our clients. So if you're transferring from the UK, our starting point is that we have effectively the same regime. OK, so we've got in force in the UK, the UK GDPR, which to all intents and purposes is identical to the EU GDPR at the moment and the Data Protection Act 2018, which has some specifics. So the good news is that if you are exporting personal data from the UK, you can export it to all of the EU member states because they are all deemed to be adequate by the Information Commissioner's Office. In addition, any country that had a European adequacy approval as at 31st December 2020 is approved by the UK. So we keep that parity with the EU. And then the EU since then added South Korea to the adequacy list and the UK has also added South Korea. But we can give adequacy approval to countries that the EU doesn't, get, doesn't have on its list. Um, and I think it's interesting to try and work out whether we might find that the US goes on to a UK list. And Joe will talk a little bit more about transfers to the US later, later on. I mentioned just in the last slide, there is a UK data reform bill. Um, and in the Queen's speech, it was made clear that the data reform bill was going to be put through Parliament. And assuming that that follows some of the consultation that we've seen previously, there will be differences and there will be a, de a degree of divergence. And that causes a potential risk for us in the UK, because if we diverge too far, we lose our adequacy decision. So we'll be keeping very much a watching brief on that bill as it goes through. There are some other mechanisms that you can use. So Article 49 of GDPR um, allows for, for mechanisms. There's actually a mechanism that I've not put up on this slide, and that is consent. So you can always do an international transfer of personal data if the data subject has consented. Now, the obvious issue around that is if you're trying to do large transfers of personal data internationally, getting properly informed consents from all of the data subjects is just about impossible. But if you're doing a small international transfer and you're able to get in touch with the data subjects, if there are maybe half a dozen of them or a, a relatively small number, you can probably get consent. Um, so we don't very often use consent, or at least we're not very often consulted on consent, because if one of our clients is using consent, then there's, there's no issue really that they need to come and talk to us about unless they've got concerns about whether that consent is a valid and properly informed consent. So some of the other mechanisms, if you're transferring to a country that does not have an adequacy decision, are binding corporate rules. So that's a set of internal rules within a group of companies that set the rules for data transfers. They have to be, um, they have to satisfy one of the supervisory authorities. Um, so it, it's not a quick thing to do, but it's something that groups of companies, particularly international groups, do put in place. 
and they can be very useful. The second is standard contractual clauses, and we're going to talk a lot about standard contractual clauses, or SCCs as they're known. There's also the potential for codes of conduct and certification mechanisms, and they're not becoming the norm yet, but cloud service providers are definitely looking at that as being something that can be helpful and would potentially just reduce the size of some of their contracting documentation by removing the need for standard contractual clauses. Um, and there, there are other derogations, I won't go into them, but for example, there's a derogation that allows the transfer of personal data internationally um, for the purpose of um, upholding um, and enforcing um, legal rights. So, for example, if we are dealing with lawyers in another jurisdiction, um, we would sometimes use that as the specific derogation that would allow us as a data controller to transfer personal data to a law firm in another jurisdiction um, where we need advice in relation to, for example, a dispute. So those are useful mechanisms. Um, as I say, consent is one of the other mechanisms that we do see used um, from time to time, but it, it, it tends to need less legal advice than the other areas. Joe, back over to you. So Joanna mentioned that standard contractual clauses would form the bulk of today's session. So let's kick things off. And these are, as, as most of you will have experienced, the most commonly used method, particularly for one-off relationships and transfers. <clears throat> now the, the EU, um, the GDPR initially adopted the old standard contractual clauses that had been around for a good number of years before the GDPR came into force. Those had shortcomings, which we'll come on to touch upon in, in the coming slides. So the EU had uh, updated the standard contractual clauses um, in, in June 2021, and it set a deadline of the 27th of December 2022 to update existing arrangement agreements. So that means the new, the new clauses need to be, to be used by the end of this year. That, in our opinion, is quite a significant deadline. Sitting alongside this, the UK introduced new standard contractual clauses, but these are known as the International Data Transfer Agreement. These came into force in, in March 2022, and organisations who, who wish to, to con continue using the old standard contractual clauses may do so in the UK until 21st of September 2022. However, these existing standard contractual clauses need to be updated by the 20th of March 2024. So you can see there's a bit of a, di a divergence in the timelines for updating various uh, standard contractual clauses. And getting that right is, is something that we're, we're, we're going to shed a little bit of light on throughout today's presentation. It's also important to, to note that sitting alongside this, there's this new obligation to conduct a transfer impact assessment. That follows the SHREMS 2 case, which again, we're going to touch on in a little bit more detail. So we'll talk through um, each of these uh, in a little bit more detail in the following slides. So I'd mentioned that the old sand contractual clauses had some, some rather obvious shortcomings that needed to be updated. So while these remained available when the, the GDPR came into force, there was a need to bring these in line with the new legal framework, in particular to update them in line with the GDPR and evolving case law in, in, in the European Court of uh, Justice. As you would expect, and, and many of you will, will have seen already, there are more enhanced uh, transparency obligations within these new SCCs. There are new clauses on data subject rights, data breach notifications, and rules for onward transfers. In addition to this, the old SCCs were no longer adapted to the realities of what our digital modern economy is. We have much more diverse processing uh, and, and more complex processing chains. Um, and there was very much a need to have new standard contractual clauses to reflect this. There are now, of course, additional transfer scenarios and the scope of the previous SCCs was limited only to controllers to controllers and from controllers to processors. And the modernized SCCs can be used for, 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 for more relevant scenarios, which we'll come on to touch upon. One example of this is the processor to processor and the processor to, to controller clauses. And these uh, are very relevant to, to many modern day scenarios where processors use third party cloud providers such as Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. And those clauses can be used to cover those situations. 
It's also important to note that the architecture of the SECs have also been modernized as part of this process. There are three separate sets of EC, the three sets of SECs covered two range of transfer scenarios, and this has been replaced by the modular setup of the new SECs. Again, we'll come on to touch upon this. And the new SECs also provide the additional flexibility, for example, by allowing the accession of parties throughout the contract life cycle. So on the 4th of June 2021, the European Commission adopted two new sets of SECs. Firstly, SECs for uh, the relationship between controllers and processors. These can be used by an array of agencies to provide a coherent approach for the relationship between controllers and processors throughout the EEA. And secondly, SECs as a tool for data transfers, which is the focus of today's session. And these can be used to comply with the requirements of the GDPR for, tran for transferring personal data to countries outside of the EEA. And these can be used by data exporters without the need to obtain prior auth authorization from a data protection authority. So after the 27th of December of this year, it will be no longer possible to rely on the previous SECs to lawfully transfer data to third countries. I think that position is quite clear. And it's that deadline that we think is going to drive much of the, the updated uh, modernization of international transfers within many organizations. As I'd mentioned, there's a modular approach to these, these new SECs. I'm going to cover those in a little bit more detail now. Module one, which I think we'll all be familiar with, is the transfer from a controller, i.e. a data exporter, to another controller, the data importer. Module two allows data transfers from a controller, again, the data exporter, to a processor, which would be the data importer. Module three, and, and now we're getting into slightly new territory, applies to data transfers from a processor, i.e. the data processor being the exporter, to a sub-processor being the data importer. That would cover the scenario I'd mentioned before, such as a cloud services provider. A module four applies from a processor, which again would be the data exporter, to a controller, the data importer. Again, a new module. So the new SECs can be used by controllers and processors within the EEA to transfer data outside of the EEA, in particular by an EEA controller to transfer personal data to a controller or processor outside the EEA, provided that that uh, data importer is not subject to the GDPR. It can also be used by an EEA processor to transfer personal data to a sub-processor or to a controller outside the EEA on whose behalf it is processing the personal data. And again, provided they are not subject to the GDPR. The direct applicability of the data protection rules to certain uh, processing operations of controllers or processors outside the EEA, because specifically the EEA market uh, by offering goods or services to individuals. So these SECs can therefore be used by non-EEA controllers and processors for transfers related to these processing operations to non-EEA entities. And that's an important point to note. It's also important to note some exclusions. The SECs do not cover, cover the following scenarios. They do not cover data transfers to controllers or processors whose processing operations are directly subject to the GDPR. The SECs have been developed to ensure continuity and protection uh, in case of data transfers to data importers that are not subject to the GDPR. And they do not work for importers whose processing operations are subject to the GDPR as they would duplicate and in part deviate from the obligations that already follow under the GDPR. It's also important to note that they're designed for a commercial context and they're not adapted to data transfers for international organizations. So, so again, it's like a very clear limitation on how these SCCs should be used. To help with this, the European Commission recently published guidance on the, new, on the use of the new SCCs. Their intention is, of course, that this will this will be dynamic and will evolve over a number of years and covers points such as the requirements for signatures, whether the text can be changed and whether the clauses can be supplemented with the with party's own clauses. So that's a quick whistle stop tour, whistle -stop tour of the EU version of the SCCs. We're now going to move on to, to look at the data transfer arrangements uh, using the UK's IDTA. Thanks very much, Joe. So 
um, as Joe says, we've finally got some updated standard contractual clauses, but the ICO, as you would expect, has been busy. And in March, we got some new documentation um, that was produced by the, the ICO, and that's actually been quite useful. So I'm going to talk about two elements um, of protection that you would use when you are transferring out of the UK to elsewhere. Okay, so assuming that it's not a territory that's adequate, um, you need to either use the International Data Transfer Agreement or the UK version of the standard contractual clauses. So I'll deal with the International Data Transfer Agreement, the IDTA, first of all. And it's available on the ICO's website. It's a standalone document, and the purpose of it is to introduce through a contractual mechanism, protections on personal data that are equivalent to the UK GDPR protections. And it does that by setting out the protections. And these protections are very much based on the EU standard contractual clauses, but the whole document looks different. So it assumes that it sits alongside an agreement. So for example, if you've got a services agreement, you would put in place the IDTA as a standalone document sitting alongside the services agreement. So you'll need to think about that when you're drafting your services agreement to ensure that you're bringing in the IDTA by reference, whether you do that as an appendix um, so that it's clear what it looks like, um, but it does need to be signed as a standalone document. And it doesn't follow the modular format. So Joe was saying that the new standard contractual clauses are quite attractive because they have these four different modules. The IDTA doesn't do that. So that means that if you are a controller appointing a processor, you still need to have the Article 28 GDPR clauses. So those are the standard clauses that you'll be familiar with when you're appointing a processor. So the, these are the clauses, for example, the processor will only act on the um, instructions of the controller and they'll have adequate safeguards and they'll have staff who have undertaken confidentiality obligations. So Article 28 sets out some clauses that you must have in a controller to processor arrangement. They are included in the standard contractual clauses, but they are not included in the IDTA. So please bear that in mind when you're using the IDTA, because that's quite significant for a UK controller who uses a foreign processor. I would say it's clearer and a bit more user friendly than the EU SCCs. Um, and it's the, the one size fits all agreement does make it easier to use than the modular SCCs. Um, although I think the outcome of the SCCs is, is quite good. Um, and it can be used even if the importer is directly subject to the UK GDPR. Um, and what it does is it disapplies the sections um, which contain specific UK GDPR obligations because the importer is already subject to those. When would you use it? You would use it if you're just looking at UK personal data um, and, and UK um, organisations. So if the UK GDPR applies to the personal data, then the International Data Transfer Agreement is a very useful document to use. But it only ensures compliance with the UK GDPR. It doesn't ensure compliance with the EU GDPR. So if there's an international element to the data transfers, then you need to be using the standard contractual clauses. Okay, so Joe, let's go on to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so the second document that the ICO has produced is an addendum to the EU standard contractual clauses. So as Joe says, you have the benefits of the EU standard contractual clauses with their modular form. So you can choose the form that suits you best. If you use the addendum um, to the EU SCCs, 
then you will have your data processor, your data processor provisions that I was talking about. And it's a fairly short document, the addendum. It's nine pages long. Um, and it does exactly what you would expect. The, the addendum amends the new EU SECs so that they can be used to make international transfers of data from the UK to, to, to other places. It does, again, what you would hope it would do. It replaces references to the EU with references to the UK, changes references to the EU GDPR to UK GDPR, um, and changes the references to European supervisory authorities to the information commissioner. But other than that, really, they're identical. So it does take nine pages to, to make the changes, but um, it gives you a known set of standard contractual clauses for multinational organisations and multi-jurisdictional transfers. So I think it's it's very useful um, if you have a situation where you've already entered into the new EU SCCs and you need a UK element to it so you can bring in the addendum to it. So I, I, I think it's more likely to be used um, than the IDTA because the IDTA I think is, is very geographically restricted. Having said that, we've seen both the IDTA and the addendum to the standard contractual clauses being used. But if you are doing multi-jurisdictional transfers, then the EU standard contractual clauses with the UK addendum, I think are probably the way to go. So we mentioned we'd come on and provide a little bit more information about this requirement to now conduct a data transfer impact assessment. And this is the direct requirement of the SHREMS 2 case, um, which required um, organisations, data exporters, to consider what laws the data importer would be subject to. So it's important to note that, that using one of the, you know, the transfer options alone will not be sufficient to ensure compliance with the UK GDPR or the EU GDPR. Organisations must now carry out this transfer risk assessment to quantify the risks that are specific to the context of the transfer being undertaken or envisaged to be undertaken. The assessment, and some of you may already be conducting these, must take into account the local laws and practices uh, of the important country. Um, so you've got to consider uh, the obligations on the data importer uh, and how this may affect the, the transfer. Um, for example, what laws they are subject to, whether or not there is a, a supervisory authority in, in that jurisdiction. And the aim here is, is ultimately to ensure that there is um, a, an adequate level of protection for the data that is being transferred. Um, you've also got to, to consider the respect to the essence of the fundamental rights and freedoms that is recognised under the UK law. Uh, so it's also necessary to consider whether or not uh, similar democratic rights also apply in the jurisdiction to which the data is being transferred to, and whether there are any safeguards there um, that, that would be recognised uh, under the UK laws. Uh, the IECO proposes to release a transfer risk assessment tool, which will assist organisations conducting this assessment. I think that would be very welcome. Um, but it's also important to note if there is no transfer of personal data, uh, the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR uh, will not apply. So for, for example of that, um, and it's a very common example that we're seeing in practice, it, it is, a, is a, for example, an employee uh, of a company based in the UK accessing their work laptop from abroad, for example, the US, that's a scenario in which would not constitute a personal data transfer uh, and it would not be necessary to conduct a transfer impact assessment in that scenario. If it is determined that uh, the laws and practices are non-adequate in the third country, um, for example, does not provide a level of protection essentially equivalent to the UK data protection regime, then you will have to consider what supplementary measures may be put in place before any transfer is made. Again, very helpfully, the European Data Protection Board has released guidance on supplementary measures that can bring the level of data, uh, the level of protection to data transfer up to the standards required under the UK and, and, and the EU GDPRs. Um, these, of course, need to be considered on a case-by-case 
basis to work out the specific nature of the transfer, the context, and, and of course, take account of the relevant laws in those jurisdictions to which data is being transferred. Additional measures that, that are envisaged by the EDPB are those that I've mentioned on the slide, encryption and pseudonymization of data. But again, these need to be considered on, on a case by case basis. Again, the EDP has recognized that the nature of these supplementary measures may change over time as new technologies come on board. But at this stage, I think the message is very, very much um, if, if, if there isn't, you know, the essentially equivalent um, data protection, uh, protection on offer in these third countries, the advice is very much do not transfer. And that becomes a little bit more tricky to, to justify a position whereby you've carried out an impact assessment but are unable to identify steps that, that, that are able to bring you up to, to equivalent levels of protection. So Joe, pass back to you for a short summary of where we've got to in both the EU GDPR and the UK IDTA. Yeah, um, I think um, it's worth just recapping. So if it's from the EU member states, it's the EU SCCs, no addendum required. Okay. If it's UK only, use the IDTA. And where the transfers are from both the EU and UK to somewhere else, um, you either use the EU SCCs with the addendum or you use the separate IDTA. Um, the addendum is fairly practical. Um, and I, I think that that is generally what we, we will see um, where the transfers are from the EU and the UK. Okay, so that's the EU SCCs with the UK addendum. Thanks, Joe. You mentioned that we'd come on to discuss the hot topic of EU US data transfers. And, and for those of you who've been in this space long enough, you'll recognize the previous regimes of Safe Harbor and then the Privacy Shield. Both of these have, um, as you may know, been subject to challenge by the privacy um, uh, um, uh, activist Max Schrems, um, who's an Austrian-based uh, privacy activist and, and who has taken, taken uh, or, or set his sights firmly on these transfers that he does not feel comply with the uh, EU data protection laws. And there have historically been two key issues around this. Um, particularly when we look at what protections there are for personal data in the US. And those are, in, in his view, that the US system, legal system does not provide adequate protection to data subjects against electronic surveillance or signal intelligence activities carried out by the US federal authorities. And sitting alongside this, the data subjects that are affected by these surveillance activities do not have a right of redress that is what is referred to as being essentially equivalent to the right of an effective remedy before an independent and impartial tribunal, as is guaranteed under the UK GDPR. So we're in this uh, transition phase whereby a new EU-US transatlantic data, protection, data privacy framework has been proposed. Um, a very recent update to this is, is that the EU um, plenary session for June has, has identified that, that work is ongoing in this basis and, and that a draft framework can be expected in the coming weeks, possibly with, with adequacy being granted to that in, in the final stages of 2022 or perhaps early 2023. But I think the the you know the red top red, red hot topic here is, is will this stand up to scrutiny? Uh, particularly from, from Max Rems and, and his organization, uh, None of Your Business. Um, I think particular concern will be that the US government is, is not necessarily promising to stop the use of signal intelligence or electronic surveillance, which is, is a rather immediate concern. It is, however, or has, however, you know, indicated that it is willing to limit this to, to issues of legitimate national security interests. And, and it's also claiming that the impact of this on, on individuals will not be disproportionate. However, the US surveillance was already held not to be proportionate by the CJEU and previous agreements have fallen twice at this hurdle, which suggests this may be a, a difficult barrier to overcome. Another rather obvious issue is the formation of the Data Protection Review Court, which is being proposed. And this will be formed under an executive order by the US government and again, may lack the legitimacy required by the Schrems II judgment. 
So it's very much watch this space to, to see how this evolves over the over the next few months. Um, but there is no there is no silver bullet to solving this issue. There is, however, that this you know possibility of the UK taking a slightly different tack to the rest of the EU, which Joanne has already touched upon. Um, and at the moment, the UK is already considering establishing trans-border uh, data flow partnerships with a number of organisations from Australia, Colombia, the Dubai International Financial Centre financial center, Singapore, and indeed the US may be, may be one of their top priorities in this area. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, in considering any divergence between the UK and the EU position, I think it's important to, to reflect on, on the value of the adequacy for, for UK and EU transfers currently. And some estimates have indicated that the cost for UK companies, if it didn't have adequacy, would, would be extremely significant um, between between the UK and the EU and that's something that, that, that may be jeopardized by taking a slightly different approach. Um, again you've obviously got lingering concerns over whether or not that loss of adequacy um, with the EU may lead to, to the UK being a less attractive place for, for, for technology companies in particular to do business. So it's very much a case of watch this space, see how things evolve. But I think over the next few few months and years, we're going to see a little bit of divergence between practice in the UK and the EU. And obviously the, the core to that will be whether or not the UK is able to maintain adequacy. So we're now going to come on to some, some practical examples, really to put into practice what we've considered as part of today's uh, seminar. So. The first one is an Australian company with subsidiaries based in Germany and the UK wants to set up a single database for its HR information. As is common, this is hosted by AWS in Germany. It can be accessed from all three locations. That is access from Germany, the UK um, and Australia. So what do we need to consider? Well, there is a transfer of personal data as there are three different entities that are going to be accessing it. The transfer of personal data between the UK and Germany is covered by adequacy. As we said, that, that's covered by adequacy for now, but may be subject to, to change in the future. Um, it's important to note that um, Australia is, is not deemed to have adequacy at this moment in time. So, so that is a, a, an additional transfer. So the transfers of personal data from the UK and Germany to Australia need to identify a safeguard or a relevant derogation. As mentioned before, this also needs to be accompanied by a transfer impact assessment. And of course, put in place EU SCCs plus an addendum as, we, as we've covered as part of today's session. And apologies, this, this last little click that's up the adequacy list, which, which I've referred to already, Australia not being covered by that. A second example is a UK subsidiary of a French parent has been told that it must use the same invoicing, invoicing software as the French parent. The information within that will be segregated so the French company cannot see the UK information and vice versa, the UK company cannot see the French information. A third party vendor of the software is based in France, it hosts the software in France. But it does have a US parent company which is involved in providing follow the sun IT support. So what do we need to consider? Well, there's no transfer of personal data between the UK uh, and French companies as, as neither has access to each other's data. The contract with the, uh, the software provider um, should include EU, UK, GDPR compliant provisions. And by that, we mean provisions that comply with Article 28. It should also include the standard contractual clauses as a US element, i.e. the transfer to the US um, uh, will be required to be, to be covered by an appropriate transfer mechanism. And also, given the outputs of the transfer impact assessment, it should also be uh, the, the you should also consider the additional safeguards given given the limited nature of the US access now. That impact assessment may not require anything specific, but it does at least allow you to, to give an assessment to, to what could be considered to be appropriate and whether or not, um, given the nature of the provider, they may be subject to, uh, to surveillance um, under the US law. <laughs> 
So hopefully those give you a, a bit of a flavour of, of what we're seeing in practice by way of practical examples. And I'm now going to pass back to Joanna to, to, to outline how SMW are already helping in this area. Yeah. Um, what I would say is have a proper think about which mechanism you're going to use. So whilst I've said that the addendum is likely to be used, it doesn't fit every single scenario. Um, so when you're thinking about this, consider the IGTA and consider the EU standard contractual clauses with the addendum. And please feel free to come and speak to us um, because, for example, there, there are some slight anomalies in that um, the EU SCCs can only be used in the four scenarios that Joe talked about, whereas the IGTA can be used in a number of different scenarios. Um, and the EU standard contractual clauses can't be used if the importer is directly subject to the UK GDPR on an extraterritorial basis, but the IDTA can. So there is some thinking to be done, but that thinking needs to be done soon. Um, because if you have EU standard contractual clauses in place, um, the, the old ones, you need to be replacing them by December 2022 um, from an EU perspective. Now we've got longer from a UK perspective, we've got till 2024, but I think it'll be the EU timetable that tends to be driving people's desire to make all of this um, properly up to date. And it's not a tick box exercise. So as I've said, you, you need to be thinking about which of the mechanisms you're using. And you also have to be doing the transfer impact assessments um, in the same way as we've all got used to doing data protection impact assessments and legitimate interest assessments. Transfer impact assessments are now a thing um, and they, they take a bit of time to get used to. Um, you can put in place other mechanisms such as binding corporate rules. Again, that takes time. So if you need help with that, please come and speak to us. But really my main plea to you is don't leave this until December, 2022. We'll be putting out information about what people should be doing. We'll no doubt be getting in touch with some of our clients directly. Um, it would be quite nice if people would engage with us before the beginning of December, um, because otherwise you're going to be doing this in a rush and that's not the best way to do it. So I hope you found this helpful. If you've got contacts in our media and technology team and you think we can help you, please get in touch. Otherwise, please get in touch directly with Joe or with me. And if anyone has any questions, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, so if you do have questions and you want to put them into the Q&A, um, feel free to do that just now. I'll just give people a couple of minutes to type in any questions. So at the moment, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll maybe close this down um, just in a minute or so. And um, ah, so is there any indication of time scale for the ICO to publish the tool? Joe, do you uh, know? No, sadly, sadly, no time scale to my knowledge. Um, but it, it, you know, recently we've been providing a couple of short updates on on the data protection landscape by, by way of articles. And if this is something that, that is going to be of serious interest to people, Joe, I think it's probably one that we can that we can incorporate a short update online. So we will be sending that out through our usual channels, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, etc. Yeah. Okay. Um, will a recording of this be available? Yes, it will be. Um, and then question about whether if you are using a flexible benefit provider for UK staff that has subprocessors outside the EEA, do we need standard contractual clauses? 
So your contract will be with the um, provider as the processor and that processor will need to put standard contractual clauses in place with the sub-processor. And that's one of the benefits of the new standard contractual clauses is that they have processor to sub-processor. Um, they, they have a module that does that. Joe, is there anything else you want to say on that? Yes, I think it's probably just worth that consideration as to if, it, if it's UK individuals only, um, um, whether or not it's just the, the UK GDPR that applies in that scenario, or, or if there's also data of, of EU citizens as well. So uh, an approach either either using the um, UK addendum or, or, or applicable EU SCCs would be, would be the approach there. Yeah. And there are several questions about um, when will transfers to the US be acceptable? Are they acceptable under the SCCs, um, particularly considering um, the recent challenges throughout Europe? Joe, you were covering US? Yeah, I, I, I think it's almost nigh on impossible to, to make a transfer to the US in, in any way that would satisfy some individuals based in, based in the EU. From, you know, from our perspective, I think all organizations can be expected to do is, is to use the appropriate transfer mechanism, if that's the, you know, the UK IDTA or, or the addendum or the EU SECs to use that, accompany it with the, the data transfer impact assessment and, and then take any, any steps that are, um, you know, are, are reasonable in the circumstances to, to ensure that the equivalent level of protection is then being granted. I'm not sure we can do anything about whether or not that data is, is going to be accessed by, by EU, uh, US surveillance organisations. But I think we're now in a position, particularly in, in, in the UK and EU, whereby we have to at least carry out that assessment and categorise the risk of, of it being accessed by, by US surveillance authority. And, and legitimately, I think, consider whether or not alternatives are, are acceptable. And, and, you know, some of the commentary that's come from, from Max Schrems has been where uh, there is an, e, an EU provider of a similar um, solution, often it's a technology solution, his advice would be use that EU provider. Now, organisations have to consider very carefully whether or not that EU provider is able to offer the same standard of service, whether or not they are equivalent cost. Um, but, it, but it's very difficult, um, I, I won't say impossible, but it's, it, it seems very difficult for organisations to, um, to, to transfer data to the US in a way that would completely satisfy um, privacy campaigners such as Max Schrems. Yeah, it's, it's very much a, a moving landscape and it's, it, it's quite unsatisfactory, I think, knowing that you need to make these transfers, um, but equally knowing that they're always potentially open to challenge. But I, I, my final comment there, Joe, would be that most of the heat in, in this scenario is aimed at the larger technology companies. Those have certainly grabbed my headlines. It, it, it seems to be that there's, there's been very little um, targeting or, or review of, of, of transfers by, by smaller organizations using you know, routine service providers in the US. Yeah. Um... It's a question here, if a UK based company also has employees in an inad inadequate country, is there no need for SCCs? And that's um, that's the scenario, I think, Joe, that you talked about, which is where, um, where there is a single corporate entity um, and data is being accessed from a different country, then that is not a data transfer. So if... Um, if I'm in the UK and somebody else is in a country without an adequacy decision um, and that person wants to access my corporate data and they're an employee of the same corporation, then there, there is no international data transfer um, that needs to be documented. So. Yep, that, that's correct. If that organisation or, or those employees were engaged by a, by a subsidiary company or a separate with separate legal personality, 
that position would change. But but as far as a, as a branch office goes, where employees are employed by the same entity as, as the UK based entity, that would not constitute a transfer in the same way that an employee taking their laptop on holiday or, or traveling for a business trip would not constitute a transfer. Yeah. Um, and uh, there, there are one or two questions coming in about um, are we always going to have to resort to SCCs and IDTAs in EU and US or UK to US transfers? Um, and I, I suppose the answer there is yes, unless there is some sort of agreement that is put in place. And of course, as soon as there is any agreement or finding of adequacy, that's likely to be challenged by Max Schrems. Um, so I, I, I kind of feel that we're only ever in a, in a temporary suspension um, of the issue. Joe, I don't know how you feel about that. No, I, th I think that's right, Joe. And, and, you know, as we both know from, from recent experience, you know, uh, service provider, providers in the US are, are already adopting the, these SCCs, so, so I don't think any of them are holding out great hope for, for long-term reliance on, on the data privacy framework. Yeah. Okay, it's 10 to 11. I'm going to wrap this up just now. Thank you very much for attending and thank you for your participation, those who've asked questions. I hope that this has helped to clarify some of the issues around international data transfers and we look forward to running further webinars on this, hopefully with any further clarifications as they come up. Thanks very much for your attendance.